Hello and thank you uh, for coming to our online uh, event, uh, Cities in the Aftermath of the Earthquake, uh, as part of Turkish Week at LSE. This event is uh, co-hosted uh, by the European Institute and Contemporary Turkish uh, Studies. My name is Yaprak Gürsoy and I'm Professor of European Politics and the Chair of Contemporary Turkish Studies at LSE. If you are on Twitter and want to share your impressions of this event, you can use hashtag LSE Turkey. We are also recording the event and we will try to make it available as a podcast. Before introducing our distinguished speakers today, um, I want to give you a bit of information on how this panel came about. As you know, around 30 days ago, we had two devastating earthquakes in southeast Turkey, uh, close to the Syrian border. And the, these earthquakes were followed uh, since then by aftershocks, several aftershocks. This, be, this has been a major and unprecedented uh, devastation. According to official figures, nearly 50,000 people died in horrible conditions. Nearly um, 3 million uh, people are currently displaced and survivors, survivors have been through unimaginable pain. Uh, families have been broken and children and babies have been orphaned. It is fair to say that anyone with any connection with Turkey has been grieving since 6 February. Within a week of this uh, event, uh, with colleagues across the LSC and as contemporary Turkish studies, we have been thinking about what we can do uh, to help uh, the earthquake victims. Being in the UK, obviously we couldn't do much and it seemed like giving aid was the only option. But we also quickly realized that we needed to work, um, uh, raise uh, awareness, work towards raising awareness. As people carry on with their normal lives and routines around us um, and other news items are getting ahead, uh, it became imperative uh, to keep the devastation on our agenda. Um, we had Turkish Week uh, planned a long time ago. Actually, we started working on this organization uh, in uh, October. Uh, we couldn't cancel uh, the events uh, for practical reasons. But also we realized that we don't actually want to cancel the event series because we thought that we needed to be together, to come together, talk about different things, but also use the week as an opportunity to discuss issues related to the earthquakes. We already had a speaker in another event coming from the region, uh, Professor Nuri Gültekin from Gaziantep University. He is with us on this panel today. We wanted to hear from him. We wanted to hear um, his um, experience. Um, Professor Richard Sennett uh, was very kind and generously reached out to our colleagues at LSC Cities and asked if he could do anything based on his international experience. So he was also on board and ready to help. Um, he's going to, oh, he's here. <laughs> and so uh, it's a privilege to have him here today uh, with us. But we also had friends in the UK, hundreds of friends, uh, who organized quickly to help with uh, the relief efforts. Uh, we have two colleagues here, uh, Dr. Mehmet Karlu, who flew out to Turkey within a week, uh, worked in Istanbul um, day and uh, night, uh, worked with the city council in Istanbul to coordinate the aid, and went to Hatay to set things up and distribute the assistance. Uh, Nilüfer Numanoğlu Atalay, one of the founders and the trustee of the Turkey Mosaic Foundation, through the foundation uh, raised millions in the UK in astonishing speed, distributing to local civil society organizations, and they still carry on with this uh, work. So it's, it's, really, it's an honor to have her and Dr. Uh, Carly here with us as well. Each of our speakers will share their own varied experiences today. Uh, they will focus on what the cities and districts that have been demolished need now, uh, in the short term um, and in the future. This is of course by no means a perfect panel. I mean, with the devastation this scale, like it's really hard to cover everything. And it's sometimes the bird-eyed uh, view 
And that bothers us as well because we're lumping everybody's tragedy um, uh, together. We're aware, we're aware of these problems. We're also aware of the fact that we're focusing on Turkey and not so much on Syria, although we have Syria in mind as well. We also think that it might be a bit premature to talk about how to rebuild cities. I think in the panel we'll have this discussion as well. Um, but given that we are focusing on Turkey, and if you're familiar with Turkey, as you know, like um, speed is very important uh, in our country. And already uh, we're hearing that reconstruction projects has, has started, have started. So in, in a way, one month since the, since the earthquake, we might even be too late to talk about how to rebuild cities. There's a lot to talk about and we'll do our best. Um, and I should not be taking up more time. Uh, I will give the floor to Nuri, Mehmet, Nilufar, and Richard in this order. And each speaker will have 10 minutes for their initial interventions. Then we will take questions and have a discussion. You can type your questions to the Q&A box below your screens. Please let us know your name and affiliation. I will collect the questions and ask as many as I can to our speakers. Now I'm delighted to hand over to Nuri as our first speaker. Hi everyone, thank you very much indeed. First of all, uh, I must I must admit that it's a real honor to appear on this panel beside you. Uh, it is very tough to discuss the matter as a witness to the most recent events. About a month after the earthquake on February 6, it may be too early to talk about some truths, situations or consequences. Despite one month, we are still unsure how many people or lives were lost or how many were injured by the earthquake. And unfortunately, it appears that we won't ever be sure because we still don't know how many people died in 1999 earthquakes in Turkey. However, despite these murky circumstances, it appears conceivable to talk about, uh, you know, uh, concrete consequences. I recently traveled to the earthquake's hardest hit cities with Professor Fuad Kayman and Faizi Baban, two colleagues. The sites we see at Nurda, Islahiye, Antakya, Samanda, Iskenderun, and Arsus really shocked us. There is a big difference between what is reported in the news or all kinds of media and what is happening on the ground. Many experts also emphasize this point, the destruction is beyond imagination. I agree with them totally. Therefore, it is unrealistic to expect that people in those cities will return to their pre-earthquake lives quickly and be recovered immediately. We can predict that in the cities in the Southern Turkey, there will be observable landmarks both before and after the earthquake, if that's clear. It's simple to state that similar circumstances and outcomes also occurred in other severely damaged cities, including Pazarcık, Elbistan, Marash, <laughs> Eviaman, etc. As it's known, the earthquake in the southeast of Turkey and northwest Syria radically changed the region's physical, social, economic and demographic structure without paying attention to the borders. Northwest Syria also has had severe tragedies. The humanitarian crisis, both in the areas under the control of Assad regime and in the regions occupied by Turkey, has not been heard enough in the world due to the region's sensitive security and political conditions. When we turn to Turkey, according to government statements around 46,000 people died as of last weekend. However, most, of it, most people in Turkey, just like me, except high ranking authorities, you know, know that the official death toll is so far from accurate. And honestly to say that it looks like public opinion is right. Public opinion is right about uh, that. The primary reason is that the state or government was not there as expected for a long time as it should be, and people needed it. We are talking about especially the first 24, 48, and 72 hours. 
it was so crucial. And again, the state was a political organization and identity, but it was not a state in the ways and roles people expected and needed in difficult times. This refers to the lack of well-coordinated, institutionalized state that offers crucial aid and support to those in need and their most trying times. The predominant common opinion of the public in Turkey is that the state or government was late in providing first aid. Moreover, the government has dramatically failed to facilitate and coordinate volunteers and NGO, NGOs that want to help. We are talking about especially for first uh, 72 hours. For the first three days of the earthquake, there was a significant difference between the state's official claims of taking urgent and vital interventions and the opinions of ordinary people who had experienced this problematic pro process. As a result, the damage, rubble, fatalities, losses, injuries, and tragedies played the observable effects of the earthquake phenomenon. Additionally, it is inevitable to encounter much more complex social, political, demographic, and economic influences after manifest daily. It is undeniable that the earthquake in Turkey had some clear and visible effects that people can no longer deny. Now, I would like to emphasize state society relations, daily life, and some situations in general terms, of course. The state society interaction is the first of these topics. The characteristic of Turkish state apparatus and state organization were, were well known to many sociologists and political scientists for decades. There is a lot of literature on these issues as a result, so that circumstances was not unexpected for, city, for critics and social scientists that mean. The class characteristic of the state inherited from the Ottoman Empire have caused it to evaluate and treat every social issues as a security concern. The state, as in many other similar region, regions of the world, did not regard itself as a political entity that provided services to the people, but instead as a collection of people and population masses, the members of which had obligation to the state. And we have experienced once again, unfortunately, that the state continues to see a typical indicator of despotic, patriarchal, and hierarchical world. The civil military bureaucracy or the, the current state ideology has once again revealed that approaching every social event with security concerns reduces the most basic human and democratic demands to the ontological problem of the state. Of course, this is a kind of institutionalized political paronia. The state fell short under the problematic circumstances in the catastrophe area, I mean earthquake zone. But later, it accepted the complaints and rightful demands of the citizen, ordinary people, hostilely declaring that it saw the objections as a matter of existence. Finally, it noted it and threatened to look into the, it later like a vindictive person, vengeful person. We have witnessed that this attitude has destroyed the centuries old perception of the sacred and benevolent state in the eyes of the broad masses in Turkey. Additionally, the state's officials pressure and restrictions on social media, the internet and communication channels have raised serious concerns about how the general public views the state. National and international non-governmental organizations, the worldwide community and volunteers helped those in need in the earthquake zones despite the governments or states, you know, weakness, inadequacies, pressures, and hurdles. However, the local people in the earthquake zone, a sizable portion of which has strong conservative, pro-state, Erdoganist, and nationalist features, has considerable concern about the situation. This is so crucial uh, result, if you ask me. The fact that the first team to come to help in difficult times were from Greece, Armenia, Israel, Kurdistan, and Western countries created serious questions in the prejudice of the public in Turkey, which has predominantly statist, nationalist, conservative, and pan-Turkish 
Turkish rhetoric. In other words, the traditional view of the state, its authority, arguments, managerial style, and structure working on nepotism suffered serious harm in the eyes of people. Another reality is made clear by the earthquake was that despite the political and economic power, the construction sector had grown the years over the years. The wrong urbanization and home construction policies had been placed for decades, which had paved the stage for this tragedy. Contractors, contractors and the construction business in Turkey represent a class in Marxist term. Contractors and the construction industry are involved in every aspect of social life, from the military to foreign policy, daily business dealings to corruption. The primary cause of the catastrophe has been the construction industry's rapid and unchecked growth. Another consequence is that daily life in the earthquake zone has to change radically and irreversibly. Around 16 million people, including Syrians, lived in the areas hit by earthquake. About 80% of the population of Turkey resides in this area. Additionally, this area was home to people of various sects, religions, and nationalities, but there are indications that the demographic and cultural patterns of this area will shift and diverge. The structure of area, which is made up of numerous diverse cultures, including Alevis, Kurds, Arabs, Turkomans, Jews, Christians, Nusairis, Caucasian, Cherkes, may alter. Additionally, migration from the earthquake zone, particularly to Western Turkey, has made room for demographic engineering. Another conse consequence is economy. According to official figures, the, ra the, ra the ratio of 10 provinces in earthquake zone in Turkey, Turkey's GDP is approximately 10%. Additionally, these provinces were responsible for 15% of nation's agricultural production. As a result, the earthquake will have a negative effect on Turkish, Turkey's economy generally and on agricultural produ productivity spe specifically. The image of economic data is still unclear, nobody knows. However, the provinces with important agriculture and animal husbandry were damaged by earthquake. Considering that 1.7 million Syrian refugees in the region are also in the current economic life, the earthquake again tragically affected the lives of both refugees and locals. Another significant result or tragedy that the earthquake showed us is that more than 1.7 million Syrians living in this region are faced with severe problems. The earthquake left them homeless once again. It's known that local people have difficulties reaching aid, but Syrians have also experienced severe discrimination and marginalization in this process. This heavy humanitarian crisis, again, showed us that vulnerable groups face more difficulties. I, mo I must also say that while the future is uncertain for the locals, it's even more for Syrians. The class dimension of reflections of the earthquake's effect should be also highlighted in this context. The initial quake, the first way I mean, affected every social group residing, uh, residing in the region, regardless of class. However, when dealing with the after effects of the earthquake, the well-known truth once more and again apparent. While the poorer classes struggle to live, the wealthy upper middle class and high ranking bureaucrats could quickly relocate their families to safe areas. As a result, the poorer classes have had to demand the state's or NGO's help. It is easy to see that the poor will suffer more from this ongoing process because rich classes quickly establish their new daily life and profession, uh, professions in secure cities, while the future of education, employment, and professions was still unknown for the region's destitute and poor masses. The vast majority of people, especially the impoverished, face an uncertain future, unfortunately. 
And as final point, I want to emphasize that, unfortunately, Turkey suffers from lack of long-term planning, incorrect or false organization, the destruction of agricultural lands, the construction of illogical and unrealistic buildings that really rely on the construction industry. Additionally, the nation is suffering from the unfavorable effects of unsustainable growth, the huge divide between material culture and social values, political populism, nepotism, and weak institutions. Turkey is regretfully regret paying a high price for pushing the plan and failing to approach to the nature with a scientific mindset. By the way, the earthquake zone is experiencing huge and serious drought for agriculture. Furthermore, even during the earthquake, Turkey's dominant popular culture and politics, politics evaluate conspiracy as a reality and truth as a conspiracy. Sadly, the general tone of the post-earthquake discussions, which reflect a surrealist mindset, makes it difficult, at least temporarily, to find answers to Turkey's serious issues. But despite the weakness of the states, institutional performance and the, solidar the solidarity amongst the community, if you ask me, was amazing. I think this is the uh, one and unique positive side of the fact. To me, that is the country's reality, sad but true. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Nuri. And uh, Mehmet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yaprak, for this event and for inviting us. Uh, Yes, it was as you as you stated you know, just at the beginning. You know, I was in the region. I mean, I think you know, just I arrived in Turkey on the third day. You know, just off the earthquake immediately after the earthquake. I've got family. You know, just, I'm, I'm originally from Antep Islahiye. I've got family living there, or and my family used to live there. I believe you know, just I can say it right now, and you know, that's why you know, just I rushed to Turkey. That was one of the reasons for the first you know just week or so you know from day 3 to until day 8 i was in yeni kapı logistical center of the istanbul municipality and from day 8 onwards for almost a week i was in hatay hatay province hatay province province has different centers in antakya samanda arsuz iskenderun and then i moved to antep i spent time you know just in islahiye and nurda all the regions that Nuri Ojam has just when, has just mentioned. As he has, you know, just very eloquently explained, the level of devastation is incredible. I mean, of course, it's one thing, you know, just to watch it you know, just on TV, but the moment you go there, the moment you talk to people, the moment you touch people, I mean, you understand the level of devastation and the degree of uh, trauma is huge. I was there, you know, just during, you know, one of the I drink the largest aftershock, the one that was at the magnitude of 6.4. I was in Samanda. I was at the epicenter of it. And it was quite a shocking experience. I'm, I'm someone who lived through the 1999 earthquake in Istanbul. And after that, I again worked in the earthquake area for a couple of months. That's why I remember you know, just the experience of 1999. But this one, I was in an open air field, you know, just open air area, outdoors area in the city center. Perhaps that's the reason why we felt it more strongly. But that felt shocking to us, even the one that was at a magnitude of 6.4, and I could see how it triggered or re-triggered the traumas of the people who are trying to live there. But to give you an idea, I mean, the magnitude levels in earthquakes, they, they go up, you know, just exponentially. The difference between 6.4 and the ones that occurred is something like 32 times, 32 times. And I was asking myself, I feel really scared having lived through the 6.4 magnitude. I can't even think of people who went through the experience of 7.7 .7 and 7.8. Yaprak has asked me to talk mainly about my experiences working with the Istanbul municipality or other municipalities trying to just carry out relief work, aid work in the area. And municipalities that belong to the you know just main opposition party chp in turkey and after 2019 almost all metropolitan areas with the exception of bursa are controlled by the main opposition party and they rushed to the help of the region 
I think, you know, just they, you know, they lived up to the test and they rushed to the help of to the region. And what we could see is that a lot of the energy that Nuri has just mentioned, or that solidarity of the civil, civil society has been channeled through either civil networks or through the actions of the municipalities. Municipalities really were aided, were helped, hmm. fostered by the help given by the civil society in general. Port aid, donations from people poured to the municipalities, just as they did to civil society, you know, just organizations. I was in Yenikapu, and Yenikapu is a huge depot area, a huge warehouse. It's one of those really large warehouses. And it was a great experience to be there. Great, of course, quote, unquote. We were thousands of people from all age groups. You had hundreds of people, you know, just at the desks collecting help signing forms, preparing you know, this transparent list of donations so that that could be accountable. Hundreds or thousands more, they were categorizing those goods into different boxes, like, you know, just clothing, like food, et cetera. And, you know, just there were hundreds of others who were packing them. Again, hundreds of others, you know, just who were loading them into the eight GVs. And there was that sense of solidarity, I believe, you know, just we last felt during the Gezi uprisings. And every single time an HGV and one of those, you know, just heavy goods trucks were departing from the warehouse, it sort of became a tradition, you know, for the driver, you know, just to horn, you know, just to press on the horn. And those HGVs do have really loud horns for those of you, know, just who know that. And that has become perhaps the most emotional or romantic sound in my life for the last month, because every single time, you know, just a new HGV was leaving from there, Thousands of people, you know, just they were, you know, just applauding that, you know, just we were hearing the, you know, just horn sounds, and it was hope in action, you know, just I've been thinking about that experience since then, and today, actually, before coming here, I was at the prison, slavery prison, I'm a lawyer myself, practicing lawyer, and I paid a visit to our colleagues who are unlawfully imprisoned by the Turkish state due to the Gez uprising. And I was having a conversation with Hakan Altınay. And they are, of course, all waiting for the elections and to be freed after the elections because they are political prisoners at the end of the day. And I was having this conversation with Hakan. And Hakan told me, I mean, I didn't know about that, a quote from the Brazilian philosopher Roberto Unger, or Unger, I don't know how to pronounce it, just his surname. And what Roberto says, what Unger says is, Hope is more the consequence of action than its cause. Yes, hope in Yenikapu, in that warehouse, was the consequence of action, was the consequence of working together, was the consequence of organizing those donations and doing something. It was hope in action for most of us, and it was also collective therapy. Because we were all very much angry. We were all very much frustrated with the failure of the central state organizations. And the only way we could channel that bad temper, bad blood into a good cause under those circumstances was to work together. And this is what we have been doing there. That's why, you know, just this is what I call, you know, just in my mind, the hope in action. This is, I believe, what we did when we were in that really large warehouse. And then I moved to the region. I mean, I started working there in the locations that I've just mentioned to you and all the things that Nuri has just said. Yes, during the first three or four days, state was not there. It's obvious this is what you hear from every single witness who lived through there. As I told you, you know, just I lived through the 1999 earthquake experience. And on the day it happened, six, seven hours after that, I was in the region. And although Turkish state was again in a chaotic state, it was present. At least the soldiers were present. There were soldiers all around after the 1999 earthquake. Here, in this case, even that, even the soldiers were not there for reasons, you know, just that are that would be best discussed, I believe, by Yaprak. I mean, with her experience on civil and military relations, but the state was not there. State failed people in the rescue works. And a lot of people, unfortunately, this is the sad, tragic reality. A lot of people died because the re relief, the rescue work were delayed. A lot of people died because of hypothermia, because it was cold, it was freezing cold overnight and they could not be saved. That's the reason. And now, I mean, the post-mortem reports that are prepared by the state, state fails to help people, but state never fails to protect its back because we understand now that the post-mortem reports are prepared in a standardized fashion. And in all of them, it is simply mentioned that it's due to the earthquake. 
but there is no detailed analysis whether it could be from hypothermia, this and that, <clears throat> or that the state could protect itself from potential lawsuits. And when I was there, it was from day eight onwards, is that day seven or eight onwards, I don't recall exactly, uh, you could see that not only rescue work failed, the disaster relief work failed as well. People did not have water, I mean, drinkable water, people did not have food, people did not have shelters, tents, everything, everything was lacking. Everything was lacking. And we simply just kept receiving phone calls after phone calls from people who receive your phone number through, you know, the social networks requesting help, requesting a tent, requesting, you know, just, you know, stuff, you know, just to, to cover themselves with, you know, just requesting clean clothing, hygiene sets, sets etc. And that was almost a week, eight days after the earthquake. The state fell, failed them. And what was the feeling? Of course, the feeling amongst the people was a general sense of anger, frustration, and being let down. They felt let down by the people. But one feeling in particular in Hatay region, especially, I believe, they were also, they were also feeling discriminated against. As Nuri has just mentioned, I mean, the demography of the region is quite complex. And just, there are a lot of Arab Alawites who live in, uh, in uh, Hatay, in the Hatay province, especially in Samanda. There are Arab Christians as well. And there are people who are coming from non-Sunni, non-Turkish backgrounds. And the feeling amongst them was that, look, we are let down because of our, our identity. And the fact of the matter is the municipalities that belong to the main opposition party, they were certainly more present in Hatay. And the sense again was that, I mean, we are left to the opposition because we are voting for the opposition. And the message that the central government institutions were sort of giving was that, okay, you guys, you deal with your own guys and we're gonna deal with those who have voted for us. I mean, one thing that we know is there was a similar failure in Adiyaman. There was a similar failure in Marash as well. I haven't been to Adiyaman nor to uh, Marash. I can't get, share with you my firsthand experience. Therefore, one might say that there was actually not much of a discrimination. There was equality at the level of the failure. I mean, the state failed in all provinces, but at least the perception of those who live in Samanda, who live in Antakya, who live in Arsus was that we are being discriminated against because of our identity. And the municipality, Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, I mean, the task, I mean, the main opposition party basically mandated, you know, just those, you know, just uh, municipalities to take to be in charge of different provinces. And Istanbul uh, Metropolitan Municipality was in charge of Hatay and Ankara was in charge of Marash. Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality, that's my first uh, hand experience, they were much more present there. They were much more effective and efficient than the central state institutions, central state organizations. When we say central state institution, the one that we are particularly referring to here is the so-called AFAT. It is the term in, in, in Turkish. It is basically Turkey's national relief rescue agency and AFAD failed big time you know just Yaprak is telling me is my time is up but you know I have to you know, just summarize very quickly why I believe they failed first because of excessive centralization AFAD during the first even during the first three days they have been waiting instructions from Ankara they waited under under those circumstances, under those circumstances of emergency, they waited instructions from Ankara. That's the reflection of Turkey's present state structure, frankly. Everything goes to one single person. They are waiting instructions from Ankara from one single person. The second reason is the one that Nuri has mentioned, chronism, nepotism, and the lack of competence. You've got basically psychophones, incompetence, partisan people who fill up those institutions. To give you an idea, the person who is in charge of disaster relief, earthquake disaster relief at Afat is a graduate of Islamic theology faculty. I mean, yes, of course, Islamic theology may be important, but only when you fail in rescuing people, not in order to in rescue people. And Afat distanced itself from the civil society, saw the civil society as a competitor, not as a partner. And Afat, rather than coordinating the efforts, it tried to monopolize them. It, was, it did not work as a coordinator. It tried to work as a monopoly. Look, I'm a lawyer. That's why I noticed whenever there was a legal problem, I was trying to help out people at the Istanbul municipality. Every single time they tried to send aid into other provinces other than Hatay, 
every single time, you know, just we had to give a fight with the police officers because they were like, no, you can't send in aid here because it's the monopoly of Afat. If you're gonna send in aid, you have to, you know, just unload it at, you know, just warehouses of Afat and then you never know what's gonna happen to that. I mean, that's one of the huge failures of this, you know, just huge monopoly that tried to, you know, just organize help. I was going to say a few words about the needs in the region. I'm going to leave it to the Q&A section, Yaprak, but I can give you further information regarding the specific needs. But one thing is for, for sure, what we need is in order to help those people there in the mid to long term, what we need is a democratic, transparent, accountable state. Because volunteerism, municipalities, civil society cannot fill in the shoes of an organized state in the mid to long term, unless we've got a democratic, accountable, transparent state, it's gonna be very difficult to help those people effectively. Sorry for exceeding my time. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, Nilufar. Uh, thank you, uh, Yaprak, for organizing this important panel as part of the uh, Turkish week at LSC at uh, such a critical time for Turkey and for raising awareness uh, about this tragedy, tragedy. And it was great to, to hear from uh, other speakers and especially the first-hand experience. And I'm uh, honored uh, to be taking alongside such esteemed speakers and to representing uh, Turkey Mosaic Foundation. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our mission and our work so far, and then go on to talk about our priorities um, as we help the local civil society organizations as they take part in um, rebuilding the region in the aftermath of the, of the recent earthquakes. So Turkey Mosaic Foundation is a UK registered grant giving uh, charity uh, founded by a group of us, a group of friends who have lived here in the UK for over decades. Um, we all came together um, with a passion to give back to Turkey, to our homeland and launched in uh, January 2018, a, a charity of charities um, structure, similar to the fund of funds uh, in the finance world. We started with three grants at the start, supported by us, uh, the founders, and then our platform that we enabled for the wider uh, donor community in London grew in our first five years to over 80 organizations, and we raised more than 800,000 pounds in our first five years. Our grants include thematic funds in areas where we're passionate about creating a change, such as the Children's Fund, the Gender Equality Fund, Culture and Arts Fund, Environment and Sustainability Fund, um, et cetera. And we believe in the importance of working with local intermediary partners. Um, in our case, it's Istanbul-based uh, Istanbul uh, Support Foundation for Civil Society. Because um, these platforms have the ability to help international donors, uh, international grant-making organizations, uh, and also they have the ability to be able to reach the smallest grassroots organizations that are working on the ground. And uh, we believe in uh, the criticality of this. And what's perhaps most important uh, or relevant to today's panel has been our emergency relief campaigns in the past, in our first five years, in the after the Elazığ earthquake, Izmir earthquake, uh, the wildfires uh, of summer 2021, the refugee crisis, uh, and uh, we also launched an emergency response to our grantees uh, during COVID um, period. So our grants follow a needs-based approach um, so we hear the needs of the local players on the ground, um, and we're grateful to have that privilege of having that open communication channel um, with those um, organizations on the ground and the experts and, and those with the experience, because it, it's not possible for us sitting in London to be able to um, direct grants uh, without hearing actually what's needed. So we celebrated our fifth birthday only in January, uh, this past January, um, and soon after, on, on February 6th, we woke up to the news of, of this devastation, of this unprecedented devastation. And um, thanks to our previous experience in uh, launching uh, fundraising campaigns for previous emergency uh, relief funds, we were able to um, to start our fundraising campaign within a within a couple of hours. 
and um, we started immediately to talk with our contacts and our grantee, our previous grantees on, on the ground. And we immediately provided support for rescue operations and basic needs at the start, as uh, Mehmet Carla has also mentioned, um, to support uh, basic needs. So our track record and timely response in the immediate uh, aftermath of, of the earthquake attracted support from the wider community. And we were hosted by the BBC News the day after the earthquake and then on, on, on Sky News and then on radio channels. So we saw this um, support growing around us. And uh, now, as I speak, we've raised more than 2.5 million pounds from over 16,000 uh, donors uh, for our campaign uh, in UK and also around the world. And we are extremely grateful um, for this support. Um, this tremendous support and how our whole community, the Turkish community, as Yaprak, you've mentioned at the start, it's it's very difficult to be helpless and not be able to do anything, especially when you're living abroad and your homeland goes through this crisis. It's There's no one who's left untraumatized after what, what's happened like this, if you have any connection with Turkey. So um, we've seen this extreme support and uh, we've seen support from our community, from their own circles, schools, workplaces. Um, there are QR codes in, in London, in local cafes, shops, uh, hairdressers, um, so that people can donate uh, on the high street. There are also major corporations and funds um, and, and global organizations who are also supporting us with their relief funds or employee matching programs. So it's a very wide ranging support uh, that, that we've seen. And we have so far uh, provided 34 grants uh, to and a total of more than 530,000 pounds already have been granted. And our grants have been in two categories. First, direct grants to organize organizations with relatively higher capacity. Uh, an example would be um, our um, grant to support to life organization. Uh, Mehmet Karl has just mentioned about the need for water in Hatay. We were able to release very quickly a um, 100,000 uh, pounds grant to uh, provide water uh, in, in 12 different provinces in Hatay. And, uh, and similar larger grants. And also uh, another way we've been providing grants is through call for proposals. So we ask smaller civil society organizations, the grassroots organizations, um, that we, where, that's where we believe we have the edge uh, to apply uh, for our calls. And the grants so far covered areas um, such as rescue support, food, clean water, as I mentioned, mobile toilets, shelter, shelter for families, shelter to medical teams uh, that were also uh, used to help uh, patients in need, uh, hygiene kits, including uh, women's products, menstrual products, play areas for children, psychosocial support uh, in, in those post-disaster areas, animal shelters. So it, it was a, quite a wide ranging um, area of, of support that we've been able to provide. and. As, as we try to meet the needs uh, of the civil society organizations, there are layers at different themes and there are, there are intersectionalities um, that we take into consideration, especially important in, as, as mentioned before, in such a multi-ethnic and, and culturally diverse region. So we would like to help the organizations rebuild livelihoods when they while they respect the cultural heritage and, and the soul and, and, and spirit of the communities. It's not just a matter <clears> of building brick and mortar or, or, or physical support that's, that's being provided. And um, while we prioritize uh, such projects, we prioritize those that bring a systemic change, um, initiatives that focus on the, on the root cause of the problems and bring sustainable and, and scalable solutions. Uh, an example is, for example, um, helping the healthy functioning of food banks that can provide uh, scalable, sustainable solutions, reliable for the community and, um, and provide longer term solutions, partnering with different players uh, in the field who would like to support and to, to, to streamline the efforts. 
So rather than just short-term provision, we're looking at long-term systemic um, value add uh, as, as civil society players. So we're very much aware of the need for, um, there's need for integration for the, the population that have been transferred to nearby cities for their integration, for their livelihood. Um, there's so much need, there are the environmental damages, there, there's the rubble, there's this asbestos in the rubble, the environmental damages, the few are talking about at the moment will cause potentially long-term health risks. Um, and as uh, Mehmet Murigultekin mentioned, the, the impact on agriculture we we don't know the final consequence it's very early early to say so the list goes on and um <clears throat> I, we agree that going forward there's this need for a, an approach with many layers and and a strategic approach a rights-based approach um uh, across different timelines uh, and, and, and and in, in different, different multiple themes. And uh, as said before, no one institution has the capacity to do that. Um, it's, it's, it's such a, su such a big, big task. So there would be great need for these um, many multiple stakeholder partnerships to address these complex issues. And uh, for the world of philanthropy, we, we're a small player, uh, a, a UK based charity, 2.5 million that we provided um, is, is really a very small amount compared to this bigger world of philanthropy. And um, there is this need for us to engage uh, different collaborations in the, in the donor, um, across the donors, across different players in the, in the civil society world and, and to pull funds. So recovery will take years. There's a very long way ahead of us and um, there will be need for more awareness in the longer term. Uh, we're doing our best to create awareness as much as we can while before the world's attention shifts away um it, it has started to shift away already obviously it's been a month uh but there will be a need for a longer term um awareness uh, from the global community thank you thank you Nilifash. uh richard uh well i first have to uh, uh preface my remarks by asking your indulgence i have covid so i am uh not uh, a hundred percent, but uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, and I, I uh, come to you on this, not with any particular, uh, to this panel without any particular knowledge of uh, Turkey, although the LSE uh, through uh, the city's program has a connection with the uh, mayor's office in Gaziantep. And this is a program uh, which also connects to the United Nations, um, uh, where I've worked for the last uh, uh, 12 years since I retired from the LSC. I, I thought what I could maybe usefully contribute is to say what I, I most of the work I've done for uh, the UN has been about urban urban refugees and and um, disaster relief that focuses on cities. And it's mostly uh, concentrated on uh, uh, disaster relief as a result of, of urban warfare. I worked um, with colleagues at MIT as well as the UN on the reconstruction of Beirut after its uh, civil war uh, temporarily ended in uh, in the 90s. And I, I'm, I, I've just been thinking about what we learned there that might be useful to you in Turkey now 30, 30 years later. And the first thing that came to my mind is, um, uh, uh, has to do with the issue of trauma. Uh, if you were in Beirut in uh, 1995, large parts of the city would look like uh, parts of uh, Gaziantep or other Turkish cities today. Everything was in ruins. And the problem we faced, which I think you will face as well, is that people's trauma meant that 
uh, the, the one way they could address it is that they wanted to rebuild back the city that they'd known um, once, bef uh, once before. That is to, uh, it, it's a very natural human impulse that you want to, you want to reconstruct uh, by making something that, that sort of looks like before the trauma happened. It, it's also a process after the Second World War, which happened in Warsaw, many, many other cities that ha have, um, uh, have experienced uh, physical uh, devastation. And the problem is you can't. Uh, I imagine that in uh, Turkish cities, as in uh, uh, Beirut, that one of the reasons you can't is because your infrastructure is destroyed. Uh, you simply are not going to be able to, with uh, any any chance of, of financial support, be able to put back an infrastructure which is, is so radically um, uh, uh, altered. The city has to be rethought. And that it, in itself, as I say, is traumatic for people because the notion of restoration it appears as a way of emerging from trauma. Uh, we didn't handle that particularly well. And one of the reasons we didn't handle it well, we knew the city had to be, um, had to be rethought, uh, had to be made in a different way. But this is where um, the issue of economics uh, intervened in our work. Um, which was the uh, a disaster like this is an incredible honeypot. Do you know what I mean? It's an opportunity for new players to come in and colonize uh, uh, the spaces that are destroyed. In our case, that was a Saudi Arabia firm, which basically bought up a great deal of of um, uh, of Beirut. I don't want to name any names, but I, you and I can well imagine who would have the money in this case to come in and buy up places that have been destroyed. So, uh, and those, those people who are remaking the city uh, have no interest themselves in reconstructing it as it was before, specifically if what they're re reconstructing is small scale um, uh, housing settlements. The Saudis got rid of these as fast as they could, uh, and people felt they, you know, they couldn't. Uh, the city was rebuilt, but uh, uh, the places where they lived, the communities where they lived, had disappeared. And I, I just imagine that you're going to find uh, the same problem. Dealing with trauma about place is, I have to say for myself, something I really hadn't taken on board, how much all the physical details of a place matter to people once they're traumatized by it. That is the look of a cafe, you know? that uh, there were chairs outside that go right here. Those chairs aren't absent there anymore. That this is a, this is a way to measure what you've suffered, apart from the sufferings of family, in our case, uh, killings, in your case, um, uh, uh, real um, uh, something that's a, a natural cause, but that the measure of, of rebirth largely gets to be something which can't happen. So that's the first thing I want to say about this. This is a real, we found this a real practical issue. I would like to understand whether there is any, from you, whether there is any impulse to actually deal with that threat of reconstruction by outside players, by public seizure, of buildings that were false, were poorly built due to these amnesties. I'd just like to know if that's at all a possibility from you. Looking at it from the outside, 
somebody who's gotten an amnesty to build an unsafe building should lose the right to that building. It's just common sense. Uh, and the question is whether um, that's possible in Turkey or, or not. Um, it should be. I don't know what kind of records you have. Uh, the, obviously, most of these amnesties will be corruption under the table. But if there's some way to find out who are the people who built these unsafe structures because they didn't put in the money, uh, it might be a way for the society, not the government certainly, but for the society to affect a real fundamental uh, change. Um, oh, I wanted to say something to you about, um, I, don't, I don't want to talk about the, it doesn't, this is not the right panel, but sometime there will be the right panel to talk about techniques of reconstructing uh, destroyed buildings. This is a very difficult problem from, as somebody mentioned, asbestos. Uh, concrete dust is also something, I mean, there are all kinds of problems like this, which require a lot of money to solve and also require, in your case, rebuilding, since a lot of your physical building fabric was poor in Turkey, I'm, I'm sorry to say. These were very, very, even if they were um, um, uh, built legally, the quality of construction was very bad. And uh, that means that the actual work of trying to, 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 to put it something better in place is going to be very arduous. But as I say, that's that's a practical, a set of practical issues maybe we don't want to discuss. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about where I think there is a correspondence between the work we've been doing, not only in uh, Beirut, but in, in cities in Africa, which are subject to civil wars, is the handling of refugees this is a real issue. And I, again, it's a question for you. There is very little chance, in my view, that the people who are refugees to other places will be able to come back. That this is a watershed. It was in the Lebanon. It was in all the countries in Africa where I've, I've worked. The notion that a refugee can return with any kind of in any kind of reasonable time frame is is an illusion, and that means if people wait uh, four or five years as as they have in, in some African countries before it's even possible to return to a devastated place, they've made different lives for themselves, and the whole issue of return matters more to the families that managed to survive than to the refugees themselves. This is an incredible tension. Uh, life goes on, you know, and it sounds the scale of, I don't know how, what percentage of pop, population is, has become refugees. 40%, 30%, you'll have to tell me. It sounds like, in these areas, it's something like that. For, for those areas, we can easily say it's it's around fifty percent. I mean, we don't have so much. What? Yeah. Well, then this is you know you don't resettle fifty thousand fifty percent of your population with any kind with any uh, especially without governmental resources that are willing and able to do this within within uh, a few years. So this is a fun, what we found is that the whole notion of return becomes again, a terrific tension in the society. Now, what you may not have, which we had in Beirut and also in, in um, uh, where we worked in, um, in Mali uh, was that this crosses with the whole problem of where remittances from guest workers go. 
that if you have a family that, I, I give an example of this in Mali. If you have a family of say 14, 15 people and five of them are guest workers and they're working in Britain. Uh, if that family coheres, there's one check that goes home. But now there isn't home. There are people who are living outpost lives. And what gets to be a tension in the family is that who is working abroad to support people at home? Where? Is it the elderly people who are left behind, young kids who need um, help with schooling and so on? This is not a trivial problem because ultimately, one of the effects, what I'm trying to say to you, is that one of the effects of disasters like this is that families no longer can cohere. The impulse is there that the family wants to be together. But because of, and particularly in a refugee situation, which is at that scale, the, the, ultimate, the ultimate trauma is going to lie in how can a family cohere after an event like that? And we found it was very, we found in various circumstances very, that is quite difficult. So that's what I know from my own experience, which it seems to resonate with the problems you, you face now. The fact that you've had so much communal solidarity is really great, you know. Um, in Beirut, there was none because it was the civil war. People were fighting with each other. You're, you, you've got a different problem. You've got communities that are holding together in a government that um, sounds terrible, you know, but that the communities are, are together. This is an incredible resource. Uh, and it um, gives me hope that somehow you'll navigate your way uh, uh, somehow uh, as a community through this uh, together. Um, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, although you have COVID, we really appreciate it. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, we we have um, several questions. Actually, I'm going to try to uh, pose them now to you. Um, and if you have additional questions, you can type them. If we have time, we can do another round. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, I will ask all the speakers uh, to remember Richard's question about uh, the amnesty. Um, Richard, it's not about um, the deeds, the title deeds, right? Uh, it's you're asking well, about the amnesty. Is it about the title deeds you're asking? No, no, I'm asking no. about giving somebody a bribe in order not to have to uh, build correctly. Okay, 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 I see what you mean. and. Um, if any one of you has any inputs on that, I mean, uh, we have also the problem, of course, of um, uh, constructors uh, who built these uh, buildings that collapsed and there has been, uh, you know, a different things happening to, you know, uh, people, let's put it that way. Um, some of them are being prosecuted, some of them have escaped, some of them, um, as they were leaving Turkey, they were caught. Yes, uh, yes. But then there was also a very uh, much a big tragedy in a hotel, um, a hotel building collapsed. And um, there is, I think, now a court case, um, but it has become a secret court case, like the public doesn't know how it's going to be handled. Uh, so Mehmet might know more about these things, but it seems like, uh, you know, your affiliation uh, with certain people as a, construct, a constructor might impact what's going to happen to you or whether you are going to get amnesty or not. Um, so we'll, we'll see about that, but it's something that we need to um, be aware of most definitely. Um, and I think there will be court cases coming up, um, but let's see. So, okay, um, we have three questions uh, to Mehmet. Um, the first question is from uh, Selene Chakmak. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, uh, the name correctly. Um, so um, the question is that you mentioned, Mehmet, your experience in Yenikapu and said people were from all demographics. Uh, have you sensed uh, if other political segments were participating in the solidarity of Yenikapu, for example, AKP supporters? There's a question from uh, Ilhan Nebioldo uh, to Mehmet as well. 
Um, so uh, he says that he's aware of your efforts to channel funds to correct addresses in Turkey. However, um, the DEC failed to provide us with the names of local partners in Turkey, and it became later clear they were Kızılay and Afat, both of which were failures and not transparent enough. How can we avoid this in the future? I guess, Nilfer, this can be a question for you as well. You know, as you've worked in this field, you know, um, the transparency of where the aid goes, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you do uh, in that regard. Um, so um, um, there's also another question uh, to Nil um, So this will be your second question, <laughs> um, uh, So uh, there's a lot of appreciation in terms of your um, agility and you know organizing very quickly. Um, so um, Selene is saying that as a result, as a donor, um, uh, they felt uh, their contribution was used in a very efficient way. Um, so how have you managed to acquire these skills as an organization and uh, what facilitated this nimbleness? And thank you for your hard work. And I think we can all thank you uh, for your hard work, uh, most definitely. Um, so um, Ayla Göksal, um, um, who works uh, for Archev uh, and the Özgeyen Foundation, uh, who has been in Turkey in the past month coordinating relief efforts. Um, so, um, and um, she's echoing much of what has been said, um, is asking um, Nuri um, whether international organizations in this disaster, their presence, uh, multiple agencies and uh, INGOs, uh, although they were well-meaning, but is it possible that they have added to the chaos? What are your impressions of that, um, if you witnessed anything? And then this is your third question, Mehmet. Um, the third question to you is um, that, um, how will Turkey view uh, the international community from here on? Already struggling in the eyes of international community in terms of politics and economics, how long will it take us to recover and become a respected, viable player again, rather than a disaster country uh, to be helped? Um, I have uh, a question uh, uh, to uh, Nuri. Um, and uh, to Richard as well. Um, to Nuri, I mean, um, it is your expertise actually to talk about uh, refugees, uh, to think about refugees and their integration to urban space. Um, so how do you think uh, this is possible after the earthquakes? Um, to think about Richard's, uh, uh, you know, suggestions in terms of rebuilding uh, cities uh, from um, from a completely new perspective, if you were to build your ideal uh, urban space or your uh, ideal guardian tip, um, what would you do? What would you do differently if this was an opportunity, if you were given the role of a consultant in rebuilding the city, because this is your expertise, uh, what would you be um, looking for? And to Richard, um, I mean, you've done a tremendous work uh, through international organizations, United Nations in rebuilding cities. Um, so in your experience, do this type of help uh, work out in the end? You were kind of uh, skeptical. I mean, you said that like we, we wanted to do, do something. There was some resistance from different places. And you kind of paint the picture that even though you try to do the best, to, to do your best as a consultant, as an international organization, as UN, sometimes there is resistance. But at the end of the day, how much would you actually um, uh, support and uh, involvement uh, of um, these types of organizations uh, in rebuilding cities uh, in Turkey and elsewhere. Um, so we'll start with, uh, let's say, um, Mehmet, um, then uh, Nilüfer, Nuri and Richard. I'll ask you to be as brief as possible. I know I put a lot on your shoulders. Um, but there are other questions that are waiting uh, in the Q&A, and if we can get through them, that will be fantastic <laughs> as well. So, Mehmet. Thank you very much, Yopra. You know, this all will be quick. You know, just first answering Selene's question. I know her in person. <laughs> Selene. Uh, that's it. Uh, first Sorry answer, about that. <laughs> no uh, first answering her question, you know, just were there people you know, just who support AKP possibly. One thing is that you know just that was not a scene and you know, just people discuss politics, frankly. I mean there were people from all walks of life that was obvious. You know, there were conservative people, you know, just young people, old people, but you know just that was not a place you where know, just people really discussed politics. You know, people 
kept doing things. I mean, people were in action, you know, just rather again discussing, you know, just what had been happening. Of course, people were conversing with each other. Everyone was complaining, which is about the failure of the central state institutions. That's for sure. But nobody has asked each other whether they had voted for the AKP or not back in the past. Probably yes. Probably yes, because you know, taking in, in, into account uh, the number of conservative people who were around there, that's possibly yes. But one thing, you know, just another thing, Selena is. Uh, as I said, you know, just I spent a lot of time in that region as well, a lot of time, seven, eight days. And I've been working together with the employees of the Istanbul municipality. Most of them had been employed during the previous times. I mean, they were in one way or another close to the AKP government and we collaborated with them. And that was a very interesting, you know, sociological experience as well. It was a learning experience for them and for us because we had been vilified, demonized, you know, just in their eyes for quite some time. You know, just we are the, you know, sinful seculars, you know, just who don't do much rather than drinking their whiskey by watching the Bosphorus, right? In the words of Mr. Erdogan. And there we were working together with them, just sleeping, you know, just on the ground, not having, you know, just any proper, you know, just water to drink this and that. And we were all collaborating together. And I believe, you know, just that was a learning experience, you know, for all of us, because when there is such an event, you know, just we could unite. But the, the, obviously, you know, a lot of them, they were past supporters of AKP, they're the employees. Answering, you know, just Mr. Nebiolo's question, I think, you know, just that's a very important concern that you are voicing out, Mr. Nebiolo, especially the reticence of international organizations or international NGOs to walk through channels other than the official ones. I understand their concern because they want, they need to continue the collaboration with Turkish authorities over long-term and Turkish authorities impose this in many cases as a requirement to go through official channels. I, I believe the main answer there is to work through organizations like uh, Mosaic Institution, Nilo Ferhanem's institutions, because they have the local know-how. They know how to channel this aid without going through Red Crescent or Afat. I believe that's, or you can donate to those people, to those local institutions directly. That's another option. You can do that. But when you work people, you know, just like Nuri Ferhanem, then you know that they know the local sensitivities. They know what happened in the country and they can find the right people. I mean, Red Crescent, I've been talking about Afat, but for those of you who just who do not, who have not been following things in Turkey, Red Crescent, Turkish Red Crescent is also a shame. We've learned that. On the third day of the disaster, one of the third main Turkish NGOs that is very popular, that has become very popular in this context, up up, they have been, you know, just receiving a lot of donations. They were trying to buy tents and Turkish Red Crescent, rather than using the tents that it had in its, you know, just warehouses for rescuing people, they sold them to that NGO for a fee. I mean, they were trying to make money under those circumstances. I mean, that's, it's not an issue of being an Islamist government, this and that. It's about being authoritarian. And it's about, you know, seeing everything through that corrupt commercial lens, trying to make money even on the third day of the earthquake. And even Red Crescent was instrumentalized for that. Uh, the third question, Turkey becoming an international player again. Look, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about that. You know, if the government changes in this country in a couple of months time, Turkey is again back in the world stage. Why? Yes, of course, I mean, Turkey will go through, you know, just difficult economic times. The economy was not, you know, performing well even before the earthquake. The economists estimate the economic damage of the earthquake to be in the vicinity of $40 billion. I mean, that's almost 5% of the Turkish GDP. These are very big numbers. But the, the fact of the matter is, Turkey is a big economy with a very large potential. And there's that societal solidarity that Richard has referred to. That's the key differentiating factor. There is that potential. What matters is to have a democratic, accountable, transparent uh, government that could ignite that potential. And finally, answering... Richard questions, you know, just whether we can hold contractors to account, even though there had been some amnesties for the crimes that had been committed back in the past. The answer is yes, Richard, because we've got the case law of the Turkish Court of Cassation going back to the 99 earthquake, and it, has, it was first decided, if I'm not mistaken, in 2003. The 
the, the, the way they interpret the ratione temporis application of laws, that is to say temporal application of laws, is that they start running the statute of limitations, the time bar from the day when the earthquake happened. As they start in, and they, they consider the day when the earthquake happened as the day when the crime has been committed. That's the good. key factor, Richard, is going to be there is whether it was possible for the contractor when it builds that, you know, just uh, the building to foresee that a similar damage could occur, the element of foreseeability. Therefore, if a building was built 25 years ago, and when it was built, if it was totally in line with the existing regulations, we can't say that it was foreseeable. We can't say that there will be criminal responsibility. But if we can say that, oh, look, it was built 10 years ago, the technology was there, you knew about you know, fault lines here, the regulations were out there that you needed to abide by, but you nonetheless you know, cut the corners, then there would be criminal liability. And that would start now? Yes, th they would start from the day of the earthquake. That's good. Okay, thank you very much. I cannot remember, I think I said Nilufar next, right? Uh, okay, yes. thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the two great questions uh, from uh, Ilhan Nebuoğlu and also Selen Çakmak and also for your very kind words, both uh, Yaprak and uh, Mehmet Bey, because I could go on talking for hours about how we've managed to do what we've done. Um, the question was about, I think the most important uh, common point between the two questions is the need for transparency. Uh, because the question was about disaster emergency committee appeal, huge funds being pulled, where it's gonna go was a question mark, right? So this need for answers about how the support is going to be channeled uh, or which actors are going to be supported has been there for us since the, since the start. So we started as a group of friends and our aim was to create a platform where we could transparently say, this is our goal to support this cause or this project or emergency reliefs came after. But from the start, our goal was to be able to come together and create a platform where we would be able to show very transparently where the help was going to go. And our model was, uh, as I mentioned, like a charity of charities. Uh, we, we give grants and we get reporting from those organizations that uh, after those grants about what's been done. We, that includes financial review of the accounts. And we've been able to do that thanks to our partnership with the local players. In our case, as I mentioned, Support Foundation for Civil Society. From the start, uh, Selan Chakmat asked the question of how were you able to do this so fast and, 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 and so quickly. This, our work so far has enabled us to have those contacts. We, know, we knew exactly what we were going to be doing. In the first couple of hours, our campaign page on Just Giving was up. The first day, the figures exceeded because of the unimaginable scale of, of the, the numbers we didn't see before at that level for our previous campaigns. But we had the mechanics and the structure and we knew what we were going to do and who we were going to talk to uh, because we had had experience with our grantees from, from, from emer previous uh, emergency um, relief campaigns and from mainly the civil society players. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd say our, our experience um, and also I, I need to mention we, we are a group of friends who started this foundation five years ago. And the reason why we started it was because we were missing this platform when we were in pain from previous events. Watching Turkey from abroad, I've been here for 23 years and I came here on a scholarship to LSC 23 years ago. And my whole goal was to do something to give back to my country, but I didn't know how. Um, all my Indian friends, Pakistani friends at work, when I was working at Citibank, were doing initiatives. They all had charities here set up. And our, our community lacked that. There was, there, there was no address for such 
um, wish or or, or or desire. So we started as a group of friends to exactly fill that gap and to start this platform, which would be registered, reporting, transparent, links to local society organizations. And we're very glad to be in a position today where I think we've been the answer to this question of who do I trust? How do I know where they send the money to? How do I know and what they do with that? And this we're trying to answer with immediate updates, reporting. If you go on our social media channels, we have video updates. Uh, our Another co-founder, Yellen, gives very detailed updates regularly about what has been done with every pound. And um, this trust, I think, has been an issue for international organizations, but more so for Turkey, as mentioned before, uh, because of all the mistrust and disappointment. Thank you, Nilfar. We have actually only eight minutes, le uh, minutes left. Would you be able to wrap up very quickly, Nuri and Richard? Yes. Yeah. Me or uh, Richard, which one? Nuri, you can uh, go ahead and then we can okay. close the session uh, with Richard, yeah. Really, honestly, I don't want to blame people, but I want to let so bizarre thing. If you're up to me, if you ask me, that this, this that disaster, you know, has been encouraged and demanded by masses, by poor, because Turkish society's political culture totally changed, you know, since 50 years, six years, I don't know. The first, uh, there is a collective crime in the country, not only state, you know, because ordinary people demanded this all low and non-scientific result. Because we, we you know, Mehmet and Richard we were talking about, you know, amnesty. Yes, for instance, uh, with officially and uh, legally, you could build only four floors, but with bribe and with, with corruption, you build up seven, eight, and then you know the result. This is a totally collective crime. Not only the yes, state is, of course, guilty, but masses demanded this result. They both, unfortunately. The, the political culture of everyday life in Turkey, so, you know, as I said, changed. Now, housing culture, owing, you know, having, buying house or renting, et cetera, et cetera. Housing policy is totally false. It must be changed quickly. I don't know, I'm not hopeful just like Mehmet, I'm really sorry, Mehmet, you know, I'm so pessimist about the future, but because I know the situation, I know the, the you know, the, the field, of course, you know better than me, but I'm, I'm so pessimist about the future because the culture that we had, the culture that we have, you know, cannot give, you know, hopeful, uh, bright future, imagine for us. And for NGOs, your question, yes, there are many NGOs, we, I, I appreciate them. Without them, the situation would be worse. But due to, you know, the lack of state organization coordination, you know, the West of help aids, right on, you know, uh, not correct places. Think about in Gaziantep or in Staye or in Antakya, I think uh, witness it. In one neighborhood, you could see, you know, the amount of blankets, foods, but a few neighborhoods or streets beside the, 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 the disaster, the, the neighborhoods, you couldn't see anything. This is due to lack of state coordination and you know organization. Uh, is there, uh, yes, your question about Syrian refugees. Yes, unfortunately, the earthquake totally negatively affected Syrian refugee integration because everything has been resettled right now. Reset right now, you know, we should we should think Syrian refugee case integration. Uh, after earthquake again. Uh, Gaziantep had good experience. You know, we talked with Richard last uh, May, I think you, you will remember. But Gaziantep also has affected by earthquake, especially Gaziantep's hinterland, you know, Adiyaman, wow. Maraj, Islahiye, Antakya. Those places, those cities are Gaziantep's hinterland. Gaziantep lies on those regions with their, you know, agricultural products, human power, uh, 
capital, etc., etc. Gaziantep right now lost that hinterland. This is so crucial. Okay. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nuri. And uh, Richard, uh, my, uh, my question. <laughs> Okay, I'd be very brief. Well, the problem with the United Nations is that it is supported by nation states. And so uh, the, all the work it does ultimately uh, traces back to, to national governments rather than cities. It's a great frustration uh, because oftentimes, even in the United States, uh, there are cities that we could work with which are impossible because of this nation state funding. I would say in regard to you, if I were to be critical about what my colleagues most failed at, it was the opening of the border into uh, Syria. Uh, and that of course was controlled by the Syrian nation state or what passes for it. So um, I think the reckoning we're going to have to do is why we had the material, we, the trucks we were all ready to go. And um, the question is uh, whether the structure within the UN uh, uh, totally failed to respond to the notion that there's more than one passage way into Syria. But on the whole, I mean, I, you know, life goes on, we'll find a way to make, to reconstruct. It's just, um, in my view, I, I don't quite agree with you about this is the fault of the working classes who were, were um, uh, I, I think you have enormous um, reserves in popular feeling to do something and uh, to rebuild bottom up rather than top down. That's that's my my hope for you, at least. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's actually a nice way to uh, wrap up this um, wonderful panel. Um, thank you very much uh, to our speakers and to our audience. I apologize that we didn't have time to answer all the questions, although some of the questions I think were answered in some respects uh, while the speakers answered the other questions. Um, so thank you for your understanding. And as you know, this event was part of Turkish week, uh, which will continue until Friday. Later today, there will be another in-person and online panel at 6.30 in Center Building Auditorium, uh, and it's going to be followed by a drinks reception. Of course, today is International Women's Day, and tomorrow we will celebrate the achievements of women from Turkey again at 6.30. Um, please visit the Contemporary Turkish Studies website for more information. And thank you very much for taking, uh, taking part. And goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.